And how are you on this fine day? Hi, this is Jeff Williams with another action-packed, uh, jam-packed, action-filled information blitz coming at you here on North Star Oasis. Today is the 14th of December. That means it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. And of course, with Christmas comes shopping and all of the other holiday joys. And it also means that people start taking a closer look at their finances. Well, really in about two weeks after Christmas is over. And so we're going to go actually right into our Prager University segment of today, which is titled, How to Raise Kids Who Are Smart About Money. So moms and dads, this one's for you. Everyone knows the earlier you learn a language, the easier it is to master. Learning a foreign language at four takes a lot less effort than learning one at 40. The same holds true with managing your money. I can tell you this from personal experience. I grew up in a home where the value of money was a frequent topic of conversation. Today, I teach people how to get out of debt and build wealth with my dad, Dave Ramsey. Growing up in my parents' home, I learned a few things about kids and money. Here are three. One, put your kids to work. It's very important that your kids understand that money comes from work, not from mom and dad's wallets. As soon as your children can grasp the concept of cause and effect, and that happens at a very young age, you can start teaching them about the work-money connection. Have them clean the playroom, take out the trash, put away their laundry. There are a million things they can do. Just make sure it's age appropriate. Don't have your five-year-old mow the lawn and pay them for some of the work they do. Let your kids know that in the real world, you get paid only when you work. And it's with the money made from work that you can buy the things you want. When children work for things they wanna buy, the purchase feels like an accomplishment, not an entitlement. You're sending the opposite message when you just hand your kids a $20 bill when they ask for it, or give them an allowance for essentially breathing. Of course, not everything your child decides to buy will be a smart purchase. And that brings us to lesson number two. Let your kids make mistakes with their money. Many adults make expensive mistakes because as kids, they were never allowed to make small, inexpensive ones. Tears now will save a lot of tears later. When I was young, my parents took our family to Opryland Theme Park in Nashville. Dad and mom had one simple rule. If you want to play the carnival games, you have to spend your own money. Of course, I ran to the first game near the entrance, slapped some cash on the table, and took my turn. I lost. So I put down more money, and I lost again and again. And then came the terrible moment when I reached into my pocket and found nothing but lint. We had a whole day at Opryland ahead of us and I had blown through my cash. I ran back to mom and dad and begged them for more money and promised I paid them back. What dad said has stuck with me ever since. Rachel, when the money's gone, it's gone. Your children are going to make some dumb choices. They'll waste money on stuff that a week later they wish they had never bought. And as their parent, there are times you need to let them make that mistake and suffer the consequences. That's how they learn. Lesson number three, teach your kids to make saving a habit. Saving money is a discipline. How many adults do you know who save on a regular, consistent basis? But here's a fundamental financial truth. If you don't save money, you won't have money. Teach your children that saving is one of the first things you do when you get paid, not what you do with money you have left over. Fast forward 20 years. If they haven't learned to save, they're likely to go into debt for the things they want or need. Once they start down that road, it's very unlikely that they'll build wealth because their paycheck will be going to debt payments instead of investing for the future. I encourage parents to teach their children to save some of the money they earn. The habit of saving money is what's important here, not the exact dollar amount. The amount they save will depend on what they're saving to buy. And better for them to learn how to save now when mom and dad are supporting them. Or mom and dad, that's you, will be supporting them a lot longer than planned. So start today. Help your kids become fluent in the language of money and how to handle it. Because if you don't, 
Well, all I can say is get the basement ready. I'm Rachel Cruz for Prager University. Thank you so much for watching this video. And there are a lot of sound principles in that Prager University segment. And watching that just reminds me of all of the mistakes that I made as a kid. But I also know that I had parents who cared enough to teach me the value of work. Uh, I was just actually thinking back to my first job. I was eight years old. And the Olympic Sales Club had their greeting card sales. And since this is the Christmas season, I mean, we had our Christmas catalog. And you had to be 11 years old in order to be able to sign up for the Olympic Sales Club. This is the one time my mother lied about my age. I was eight, she put me down as an 11. She managed everything to make sure that, you know, all the agreements and everything was in place. Uh, she's the one who handled the money for the business but because uh, you know, she made the orders. But the fact is, she really didn't think that I would go out and sell. And she thought it would just be a few things amongst family and then that's it. That I'd get bored with it right away. But I took it serious and as an eight-year-old, I went around the entire town that I grew up in and I got 42 orders in like three days. And my mother just couldn't believe it. We got paid $1 per order. So I made 42 bucks in three days. And for an eight-year-old, that's a lot of money, especially growing up in the 70s. So that, that's what I was thinking about. But then I also think of some of the dumb things that I did with my money when I was a teenager and in my early 20s. And some of the mistakes I've made, I'm still paying for today in my mid-40s. So there is a lot of truth to that. And so if you have kids, make sure you teach them those principles when they're young. Because I know with my mistakes, mistakes that I've made in my life, that there's things I would have done a whole lot different if I would have known this stuff back then. So don't let your kids make the same mistake that I did. And no, I am not blaming my parents at all for my stupid choices in life. Anyhow, uh, since this is the holiday season, and we are talking about money management, one part of money management comes with being charitable. That means if you have saved and you've invested and you have money, that some of it becomes a blessing when you actually part with it for a good cause to help other people in need. And that brings us to something that came out uh, uh, earlier, it was, I think it was the 9th of uh, December, or uh, I can look it up real quick here. Uh, we had the Canadian Pacific holiday train made a stop at uh, Cottage Grove. Uh, they, every year for the last 19 years, they've, the Canadian Pacific has, uh, has come through uh, Canada and the United States uh, on their stops. And this year, on, yeah, it was on the 9th, they pulled into uh, Cottage Grove. And we were there to cover it.
So for the past 19 years, the CP Railroad has gone cross country and just some of the stops from the 2017 uh, uh, stops in Minnesota. I'm just going to read off a list of a couple of stops, just mainly in the Twin Cities here. Uh, starting with Wabasha, even though it's outside of the cities, but Wabasha, Hastings, Cottage Grove, Minneapolis, New Hope, Golden Valley, St. Louis Park, and then they go up to Loretto and Buffalo and then uh, further to the northwest into the Dakotas. Uh, I do know in the past St. Paul has been uh, been a stop. I also believe that Red Wing was a stop uh, at least a number of years ago. So they've they've been active. They've been doing this for 19 years. 15 years they've been in Cottage Grove and we're going to show you a little bit, a small clip from one of the from the ceremonies that they had regarding the local uh, Friends in Need food shelf which this stop benefited. Andy Cummings and on behalf of Canadian Pacific it is my pleasure to welcome you to this beautiful 2017 holiday train what do you think and what an honor to be here with Dallas Smith Kelly Prescott and the holiday train band do these guys rock or what let's hear it for them so I don't think I need to tell Cottage Grove about the holiday train but I'm gonna do it anyway we've been doing this for 19 years and in that time we've raised more than 13 million dollars and 4 million pounds of food for community food banks all across North America and we do that because folks like you come out and you sing and you dance and you donate thank you for being here tonight anybody interested in maybe a chance to win a ride on this train next year see a lot of you out there with cameras and with phones we would like to see the train from your perspective come find us CP holiday train on Facebook you can enter to win our capture the spirit photo contest if you win you get a second set of tickets to ride next year we would love to have you on board mayor Bailey do you want to come on out please mayor Bailey everybody all right welcome everybody to this amazing event and you know he was saying welcome Cottage Grove but what I want to say is welcome CP rail and thanks for coming and doing this for us in this community. This is our 15th year. I won't steal the thunder of uh, for here in Cottage Grove, but uh, we really appreciate all the effort and support you do to support our friends in Need Food Shelf. And thanks to all of you for your donations to this great worthy cause. So have some fun today, and I'm going to turn the mic back over so we can get to the music here shortly. Thank you. Way to go, man! Thank you. Go, Next up, I'd like to invite our friend Michelle Raggett from the Friends in Need Food Shelf to come out, please. And Mary Slusser, I understand you've got a check you're going to be presenting. We'd like to, like to see that, please. And this is a symbolic check. I, I'd like you to explain this, but uh, Mary, will you just fill folks in on what this is about? Thank you, Andy. My name is Mary Slusser, co-chair of the Holiday Train Committee. And for the last 15 years, we've been helping the Friends in Need Food Shelf. And recently, in the last couple of years ago, we decided that we were going to reach a goal of $1 million. And tonight, I would like to proudly announce that... One million dollars! Mary, thank you so much. And while I have you up here, hang on, wait right there. Mary, Mary has been running the uh, Holiday Train Committee here for 15 years. She, this will be her last year in charge of the committee. A lot of what makes this successful is the work that folks like Mary do in these communities. So I wanted to get you just a little token of our appreciation. do this but Mary has been a good friend to the train a good friend to this stop a lot of what makes this successful a lot of the great stuff you see around here is the work that Mary and her colleagues on the committee do and so we just want to acknowledge that work thank you Mary for everything you've done for the holiday train and for your community and next up I'd like to invite out uh, Jeff McGinnis Jeff are you there come on out we got to check uh, on behalf of CP as well we're gonna be presenting a check tonight to the friends need food shelf for $10,000! Oh, that is amazing! I am so wow. thrilled. That is going to go so far in serving this community. 
We work in the most wonderful community in the world, and thank you so much for everything you do all year long. We want to thank CP. $10,000! Imagine how that's going to do. So thank you very, very much, and thanks to all of you for all the support you give us. Thanks so much, Michelle. I now proudly turn it over to Miss Terry Clark. Put your hands together! And I would like to extend a warm welcome to Mary Slusser from Friends in Need Food Shelf, who is also the co-chair of the Holiday Train Committee. Mary, welcome to North Star Oasis, and it was great meeting you uh, on the 9th uh, over at the train, and I'm so glad you could join us today. Thank you for coming. And thank you for inviting me, Joe. So... I really want to start off, before we really start talking about the holiday train itself, I really want to talk about Friends in Need Food Shelf. What can you tell me about your organization? Okay. Well, Michelle Ragath is the director of the Friends in Need Food Shelf, and the holiday train is obviously a fundraiser for that, um, for that organization. And the funds that we receive from the holiday train are actually the largest portion of their income. So it's really important that we perform really well before the train comes in because our funds can um, pay for approximately 20, or not pay for, but provide for about 28,000 families or people for the food shelf. Wow. Yeah, and so because of all this additional funds that have been coming in, they can get, they can purchase some fresh fruit, fresh vegetables, more of the healthy products for their clients. How many clients, do you, you know, I'm looking for mm -hmm. more of a ballpark, not for mm -hmm. specifics, but how many people does Friends in Need uh, serve? Yeah, it's. I think when I talked to Michelle, she said about twenty-eight thousand people a year. Okay, okay. twenty-eight yeah. thousand people a year. Yes. Uh, is that Cottage Grove or St. Paul Park or what? What communities are involved with that? Sure. The Friends in Need Food Shelf actually covers and provides food for Cottage Grove, St. Paul Park, Newport, and Great Cloud Island. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then. Um, is there anything that you can tell me about people who have been helped? Um, you know, I don't get, I used to be on the Friends in Need Food Shelf Board for six years, but that was a few years ago, so I'm not in on the day-to-day -day, um, activities of that event, or excuse me, of that organization, but the people that come in are from, from the area, and they have to fill out a form, they, they're interviewed, and then if they qualify, which most people do qualify, then they are able to um, get food. And unlike other food shelves, our Friends in Need Food Shelf is available to their clients every other week instead of once a month like a, oh, a okay. lot of the other food banks are. And again, like I said, we're able to provide more healthy food. And some of the funds also go to emergency services. So if somebody's car breaks down or if their phone stops working, there is funds available for that type of assistance as well. How much would you say that on a yearly budget that the organization takes in and spends? Um, Jeff, I'm, again, I'm not able okay. to answer that question because I'm not on the board any longer, so okay. I don't have... That, no problem yeah, there. Okay. <laughs> um, I could make up a number, but yeah. it won't work. <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, you know, from, at least from the time that you were active and on the board, I mean, did you ever notice that, you know, more of a you know, rise and decline in the time of interest that people had in contributing? I'm looking at the contribution and not so much the need end. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, throughout the whole year, there they do have different fundraisers, but obviously, I would say closer to the holiday season, people tend to have more of a need. And there's um, there's toy drives, there's um, Thanksgiving drives, and um, school drives. So throughout the whole year, the Friends in Need Food Shelf is providing help for their clients, and um, it seems like it the numbers keep growing and growing where the need is there and. You know, it just takes one life situation to make a change in your whole life where things can go backwards. And then, do you have a, a website or any way that if any of our viewers want to help out and contribute that they can get in touch with? I believe it's www.finfood.org. Okay. Um, I'd have to check that to be sure. Well, what we're going to do right now is we are going to uh, show you some of the entertainment that they had with the train while we look up the website.
also have what we call the 10 Days of Giving. Uh, Merchants Bank in Cottage Grove organizes that, and they work with our school district. So uh, there's barrels that are distributed to different schools. They collect um, personal care items, food, money, pretty much anything for the food shelf. And then just as of yesterday, they went and collected all of those. So that's another big fundraiser that we do. Supermom's Bakery donates um, 1,000 loaves of bread for us and it's like a sweet bread and so we go out to the churches and businesses and we sell the bread for five dollars a piece um anchor bank has a holiday train cutout so it kind of goes wow. on and on it, it keeps growing every year so you really need to have your fundraisers pre-holiday train have you ever ridden on the train you know i actually did um i love trains as I mentioned to you earlier, I'm from La Crosse, grew up close to the trains on Copeland Avenue. So if anybody's from La Crosse, they'll know where that is. Um, but the, before 2003, it was actually 2002, I must have uh, driven, the, driven, not driven. <laughs> I've been on the holiday train. I asked if I could ride from La Crosse up to Red Wing and just see what other communities were doing. And they allowed me to do that. And it was really a memorable experience because I got off at each of those stops and just kind of watched and see what everybody else was doing. And then part of the fun was to be able to get out on the back end of the train, and I can't remember what that's called, a, a coop? No, I can't remember, it's a black pat, the platform on the back end of the train. And we were riding along Highway 61, waving at people, and actually Santa Claus was right next to me. He was riding the train with me too, so that was a pretty cool experience. Other than that, can you tell me about any real experience that you had, you know, especially at Cottage Grove? You know, what's your favorite experience for the holiday train? I would say my favorite experience is when Cheryl Crow came. What year Everybody was, thinks what year that. Was this? That was uh, 2013. Okay. 2013. And that was the Canadian Pacific's 15th anniversary. So they really had this huge event plan, and so we moved the event other to outside of the area we normally have the holiday train because we need more space. So they actually created a city. It was like a winter wonderland city, oh, and it wow. had like a little buildings in it, and Cheryl Crow was our guest singer. And ever since she was there, everybody thinks that we're going to have her back again every year. And they think, like, how did you get Cheryl Crow? I said, that wasn't up to me that year, but that was a special event. and. Um, I think a lot of people will remember that, too. I actually know a couple of people. One who was uh, at Cottage Grove on the 9th, and uh, another friend of mine, um, they were bantering back and forth about the holiday train, and saying, oh yeah, I remember when Cheryl Crow was there, and it was awfully cold, and I was <laughs> at the St. Paul stop, and I'm thinking, I missed that one. <laughs> oh, no, it was, it was cold, and it was windy, and I think it was probably one of our coldest nights ever, so the attendance wasn't as large as we had hoped for, but it was an awesome evening. Um, can I just mention to you about the yes. 2010 blizzard? Oh, by all means. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking for, ex for experience. I had one of the yeah. questions I was going to ask, and then I, I actually had it listed here, and then I can't find it. So go right oh. ahead and tell me about that. Oh, okay. I okay. love hearing about experiences. Oh, okay, yeah. Well, in 2010, if you think back that far, um, Holiday Train obviously was planned for that day, and that's when the blizzard came to the cities. And so I remember I was on the phone. I had one phone to my right ear, one phone to my left ear. We were trying to decide if we needed to cancel the event. And just for the safety of the community, they did decide to cancel the event. Um, so loving trains like I do, I thought I can't just sit here. So I actually went down to the holiday train site just to check it out and see. And there were people sitting, and it was like snow packed, but there was a few people out bundled up. And so I knocked on their window and I just said, holiday train's canceled, but would you like a glow stick? So I still was down there for that event. And um, no, that was our only one that was ever canceled. And as they say in show business, the show must go on. And mm -hmm. even if people only got glow sticks, there was part of the, part of the show. Right. Uh, actually, I do remember that storm, but not from here. I was actually in Detroit then. Oh, and okay. my father called me that morning and said, are you aware that the Metrodome roof collapsed? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's like, no. And of course, I'm in Detroit. He's thinking I'm back here. And he says, well, why are you? I'm in Detroit. Well, <laughs> later that afternoon, that snowstorm caught up with us. And I happened to have been at the Minnesota Vikings New York Giants game. Oh. 
because the dome roof had collapsed, it was held at Ford Field in Detroit, and I was actually there for that. Oh, my gosh. So I remember <clears throat> that particular it, snowstorm, and that's the reason why I wasn't around here for the holiday train then. Oh, okay. That's but, a really good reason why. <laughs> but that was definitely a memorable experience. Um, and then uh, other than Sheryl Crow, who, who is your favorite entertainer been so far? Well, and every you've seen year, a lot it's, of them. yeah, I have seen a lot of them. I mean, this last time it was is Terry Clark. She is an awesome country western singer, um, and then of course that's the first time I've seen Dallas Smith. Kelly Preston's been on there quite a few times, so they switch them up so often that I can't really say that I have a favorite singer. But other than Cheryl Crow, because I actually was able to go backstage and have a one-on-one -on -one with her, a photo, and um, and so that Not that bad. was pretty neat. Yeah, yeah. So now they had given you a award at this last uh, at this last uh, event because you are stepping down as the chair of the Holiday Train Committee. Mm -hmm. Fifteen years, it's time to turn the reins over to somebody else. What's going to happen with your involvement, and what's going to happen with the Cottage Grove stop in the future? Okay. Well, I feel very confident that after fifteen years and one million dollars, I feel like. I think it's a good time to, <laughs> to step aside, but I could see that a few years ago. The event has gotten, has grown so large, and I just feel like it's time for somebody else to take over. Um, I know the CP had asked me, like, whoa, who's going to be taking, taking care of this, uh, this role with the holiday train? But um, actually, Randy Bachman, who works at Merchants Bank, has been on the committee for about six years. And um, after a couple of asking him if he would take over his chair, he, he agreed. And he's going to have a co-chair as well. Um, but I feel very confident that the, the holiday train is going to run as normal. And I always like to change or add a few things each year. So he will maybe do that as well. So I feel very confident we'll be just fine. Well, the show must go on. Now, before we leave, I am going to ask you one personal question. Uh -oh. And it's the one that I ask every guest on this show. From when you were a young child, what is your favorite Christmas memory? Um, and yes, that's intentionally to put you on the spot. Yeah, I do really. That with everybody. It is on the spot. Um, well, I think I think my the memory would be is I had a bedroom with my sisters and brother and sisters just off of where the Christmas tree was. And to this day, I would have sworn that I saw Santa Claus putting presents under the tree. And I truly believe that it was him, because I do believe in the magic of Christmas. Do you remember what the present was that you got that year? I don't remember that one. I just remember that whole him. I saw Santa Claus. I just know that. <laughs> it was real. Well, he is jolly old St. Nicholas, that's for sure. Well, Mary Slusser, thank you very much for uh, showing up and giving us your time uh, for our audience. Oh, and, and also, thank you for bringing me a present. Um, a tumbler with the CP Holiday Train logo on it. And there it is. Um, it's still probably not that well to be seen. But still, it is a very special present nonetheless because the CP Holiday Train is one of my favorite things. And so thank you very much for sharing your stories and for your involvement in uh, establishing the Cottage Grove Stop. Really appreciate it. And make sure uh, you check out, to our viewing audience, uh, finfood.org for Friends in Need Food Bank. Now, we are going to bring you our last segment of today, and it's going to be a little bit longer segment than normal, because every year the United States Air Force Band does a holiday flash mob. And since I spent a career in the United States Air Force, and I actually did a little bit of work with one of their bands. We are going to bring you their 2017 Holiday Flash Mob here on North Star Oasis.
for Dallas Pearson Producer. I'm your host, Jeff Williams, reminding you that there are only 10 more shopping days left until Christmas. So with that, thank you for watching. We'll see you next week, North Star Oasis. out there. What a great looking crowd. Good to see you.
Proudly turn it over to Miss Terry Clark. Put your hands together! Minnesota many, many, many times, and I love the glow sticks. We haven't seen this before. The, uh, this is my first year on the holiday train, and I want to thank Canadian Pacific for allowing me to come out, out here and participate in something so very special, something that, uh, you know, this is something I've never seen before, never been a part of, that I'm honored to be a part of, and it's not even very cold tonight, by Minnesota standards. You ask somebody in Tennessee, they may disagree. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let's hear it for Canadian Pacific one more time. Thank you guys so much for coming out tonight and bringing your healthy donations. I think we should uh, do one. Guys, one more song? What do you think? One more? Yeah? What do you think out there? One more song? Thank you. 
Cottage Grove, I want to thank you for coming out tonight, supporting your food bank. Please remember Need No Stows season. Give generously year-round. On behalf of everybody at Canadian Pacific, I want to wish you all a Merry Christmas and Happy New Year! Bye-bye! And so that is some of the entertainment. Now, of course, the, we, we've um, edited it for abbreviation purposes. And if you go to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Northstar Oasis, you will be able to see the entire production from the time the train pulls in to the time it leaves. Uh, we had our cameras rolling to give you a taste of the Canadian Pacific Holiday Train at their Cottage Grove stop this year. We've, uh, we covered uh, two stops uh, three years ago that was Hastings and St. Paul and we know that we had gone over on uh, Cottage Grove so this time we want to atone for that and so we're here with the co-chair of the Holiday Train Committee for uh, the, the uh, Cottage Grove stop Mary Slusser. Mary tell me about those glow sticks. <laughs> the glow sticks are awesome as I was watching the video clip um, I noticed that the musicians actually put them on their guitars and on their um, instruments, so that was pretty cool to see. Um, we're known for our glow sticks, and it was something that we started the very first year of the holiday train. Um, I actually, because I work for a Spark promotional group, I was actually able to donate 500, I believe, the first year. And I put my logo on it and handed them out to the first 500 kids. Since then, we've um, added about four more other sponsors. So this wow. year, we had about 3,000 glow sticks that we gave out, and we only give them to the kids. I know some parents get a little bit irritated with us because they want one as well, but we want to make sure the kids have them. And when the CP comes in, they say they can always see us. They know that they're in Cottage Grove because of the glow sticks. So it's kind of very symbolic uh -huh. for our community. So this started off in 2003. How did you get involved? I love that question. <laughs> My husband actually was a locomotive engineer for the Canadian Pacific Railway and since then has retired. But he came home from work one day and said, Mary, we have to go see this train in St. Paul. I had no idea that it was a fundraiser. I had no idea it was for a food shelf. So we drove to St. Paul. And I think it was on Cedar, Cedar, uh, Cedar Street. Um, but anyway, the train came in, and I can still remember the image of it coming around the, the curve, and it was just the headlights and the, and the lights. They're not as beautiful as they are nowadays because these are all LED lights that they've got on the, on the train. But once it stopped, I remember the mayor of St. Paul got off, and then I saw hot cocoa being served, and it all came together that it was a fundraiser for the food shelf. So has this been so about 2002? It was 2002, okay. yes, yeah, December 2002. And as I stood there watching this event unfold, I said to my husband, I wonder what I need to do to get this train to stop in Cottage Grove. So, what did you need to do to get the train to stop in Cottage Grove? <laughs> well, I needed some connection with the, uh, Canadian, the Canadian Pacific. And because, because my husband working for the railroad, I had a few people that um, were able to give me a few phone calls in Canada. And so I did, I made a few phone calls and um, it didn't happen overnight because they told me at first that it, 
they were not going to stop in Cottage Grove because they said the train stopped in Hastings and it stopped in St. Paul. They didn't see any reason for it to stop in Cottage Grove. But I was very persistent because I thought it should stop in Cottage Grove. We have a great community, a very generous community, and why not? It's on its way to St. Paul. So um, after six months of making phone calls and emails, we finally, um, they finally agreed. And I'm sure there were some things behind the scenes, too, that I was not aware of, but they finally agreed to have it stop at Cottage Grove. So what were some of the parameters that they say, all right, we'll do it, but you need to do this, that, and the other. What are some of those things? You know, you know they really never gave me any parameters. They just kind of let me go with it. But what I did is, that was my first question to myself, was like, now what do I do? Because I really didn't think they were going to let the train stop. So um, I'm very active in our community. So I went to a Chamber of Commerce event, and I just started going around to people saying, do you like trains? Are you interested in being on a committee with me? And um, the committee started out with maybe two or three different people, and one was actually the current, well, the, the past mayor of Cottage Grove, Sandy Shealy. And, um, and then it just kind of expanded from there. How did Friends and Neen get involved? Well, because the uh, holiday train, the purpose of the holiday train is to raise awareness of hunger throughout North America, but especially in your own community. And our food shelf is the Friends in Need food shelf, which is located in St. Paul Park. So obviously that's the food bank that we went to. Okay. You sent off a goal, and the last clip had expanded on it in that ceremony, that you wanted to raise $1 million. How did you come up with that goal, and d was that a big figure for you of, of watching grow over the years? Mm -hmm. Well, I could see that we were getting close to a million dollars after probably 11, 12 years. And you start adding the numbers together, and I'm like, okay, three more years, it'll be a million dollars. Um, the last few years, have been very fortunate to have raised about 90000 each of those years. And so we just kind of put the goal out there, and, and I looked ahead and I thought, you know, 15 years, a million dollars, I think those are good numbers to, to make work for us. So that, for that goal, is that like the whole year we've raised this amount, or is that a set period of time, or how yeah. does that? Yeah. Well, the million dollars was, I wish I could say it was in one year's time, but it no, was I'm over just, 15 years. Yeah, I'm just yeah. talking about as far as, you know, I guess, how should I phrase this? What's the, for each year that attributed to that? I mean, uh, is, is it a year or is it, you know, for every stop, every year that the holiday train stops? I mean, how is all that calculated? Is it, we're starting this and whatever we raise year after year after year is that million dollar goal or is it just December to November, December? Yeah, it, it just actually evolved over time. Because the first year the holiday train stopped in, in Cottage Grove in 2003, um, I looked up my notes and we raised about 13000 that first year and then the numbers just kind of accruing and so it just just came up with the $1 million that is just kind of like an even, a good even number to achieve that okay. goal. What kinds of coordination with the railroad are involved? I mean now that you've been doing this for 15 years you know, it's, it's not, I, I know it's more than just, oh, we're just going to make an announcement and here's our annual stop. I, I know there's more to it than mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Well, we're very lucky to have the train stop in Cottage Grove and they continue to stop in Cottage Grove and because of how much money is uh, contributed to the food shelf. Um, but right now, pretty much in September, October, I will connect with Andy Cummings, as you saw on the on the video, he's the uh, communications director. I'm not sure if that's his okay. exact title, but um, I'll just send him an email and I'll say, hey, Andy, it's Mary checking in. And you know, I've worked with him for so many years that he knows who I am. And, and just say, do you have a date for us? Because they're the ones that give us the date. We don't get to choose. And this year, mm -hmm. we're, we're lucky to have a Saturday as the date. So they really don't um, kind of hands off. I think they know we've done it for so many years. And I've had other communities um, call me and say, hey, I know you've had a successful holiday train event, what do we need to do that in our community? So I've been able to help other And what cities. have you been able to tell them? So, well, I tell them we do a lot of pre-fundraising activities. They say, don't wait till the train arrives before to collect all your money, because that's, <coughs> you know, we collect, you know, quite a few thousand dollars that evening, but we have, um, would you like me to tell you about the fundraising events yes. that we have? <laughs> Please do. Okay. And then also, before you get into that, sure. Dallas, do we have the uh, website? Here is the website. It is F-I-N-F-O-O-D, finfood.org. 
and that's the Friends in Need food shelf. And we uh, ask that if you want to donate or if you happen to live in the area and, and uh, need service, you talk to this organization and they do a bang up job down there. And again, um, Holiday Train in Cottage Grove is to benefit the Friends in Need food shelf, finfood.org, and check them out. So, what have you told those other communities? Okay. Well, I said you need to, you know, organize your fundraisers. So, for the Cottage Grove stuff, what we do is we have a spaghetti dinner fundraiser, and it didn't start out as big as it is right now. And this is actually the second year, but before with that, we did a pancake breakfast fundraiser. But all of a sudden, the Cottage Grove Lions, the St. Paul Park, Newport Lions, all the Lions got together. And we are in Thrivent Financial. There's so many different organizations that now work on this one particular fundraiser. So that was very successful. We also